today we're going to be talking about the topic of preparing for your next interview. Um, I guess a bit of the, the dreaded one and all those kind of questions that you're fully expecting, um, but perhaps never know fully um, how to answer. So starting with today's agenda, um, we always, um, when we do these cleaning breakfast clothes, um, just kind of take a little bit of time, just five minutes to, to go through our mission, um, vision and values. Um, and just a quick one as well. Um, if anybody is not muted, is there any chance you could just quickly mute so that um, there's no background noise when people um, are chatting through? But like I said before, you will have a chance, as you'll see in the agenda, to have a little bit of a conversation moving forwards. Um, so after we cover our, um, our mission, vision and values, we'll just go into our code of conduct. But then it'll be time to dive into kind of the main event of today, where we'll be introducing Amy, um, our kind of interview expert for the day, to take you through some interview tips and tricks. We'll kind of cover some practice questions together so you get a feel for how we think you should answer them. Um, but then it's kind of over for you, over to you um, with the breakout sessions. We'll give you kind of three options or three questions that you can have a go at answering yourselves and kind of speak to um, the rest of your group on how you'd answer them. We can then all come back together and kind of share our ideas. So the mission of Lean and Lead is pretty simple, really, um, and something that I guess we're going to be challenging you with today when it comes to those breakout sessions um, is to lift each other up. Um, we realise that not everybody in life has those equal opportunities, so we're here to support and push for um, those opportunities for absolutely everyone, particularly during these challenging times of the pandemic. Um, and we are kind of the leads group, so we really want to kind of have that leads based focus to elevate people within kind of the local community, um, but also kind of acknowledging that we are part of a, a wider global movement. Um, so we kind of really have those twofold aims, kind of the local and the global. Um, so our general objectives, I mean, number one really is to increase our presence within Leeds, Yorkshire, and wouldn't it be great as well if we could do that on kind of the global community scale. Um, we really want to be recognised as a force for change, for fighting for those opportunities for people who maybe don't have um, them already. Um, and I guess with that comes our ability to serve our community and make, our, make a difference, I guess, in the local Leeds and Yorkshire area. And I guess kind of that final one uh, that we really want to look at today is just challenging each other to grow, level up and obviously lean in. A uh, quick code of conduct as well. So we have our three C's. Um, we encourage everyone to be fully committed today and invested, fully present in what's kind of going on. Um, and with that comes that element of communication. Um, so one point actually I should say on that, um, like I said, you will have the opportunity to um, speak to each other in the breakout rooms, um, but it would be great as we're kind of having our presentations today. Um, if you just kind of wanted to speak or ask questions, add your own comments in the chat, it's always nice to see kind of when we have our speakers talking, that chat kind of constantly buzzing and people getting involved. Um, it really makes my day when I can see that. So do feel free to, to chat along. Um, but also our final C is that everything that you say today um, is confidential. We don't kind of go around talking about what everybody has said um, after we kind of exited the circle. And then finally, we just included some buzzwords to kind of help anyone who's never been to a lean -in event before kind of understand what we're all about and it's honesty trust we're a safe place we respect others but also we want to be super fun and collaborative um, and even innovative and so we're almost at time for the main event but i just wanted to give you a bit of a note beforehand so that you can kind of see all of our different social media handles um, we're not too creative it is kind of very much lean in leads in different ways um, but do feel free through the morning if you really want to kind of tweet us, post on Instagram. Um, we love seeing that stuff. Um, so you can kind of take note of some of our social media handles here and we'll kind of pop them back up on the screen at the end in case you didn't quite catch them. So it's time to move in to the main body of our presentation today around preparing for your next interview. So. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce um, Amy from FDM Group, who is our interview expert today, who will be sharing with um, 
through some of her tips and tricks and also some of those practice questions. Morning everyone. Um, so yes, I'm Amy and work for FDM Group, which are an IT consultancy based in Leeds. So what we do is we recruit um, graduates, we recruit ex-forces individuals, and we also recruit returners to work, so people that have had a career break um, onto a programme. So there's loads and loads of people coming through every single year. Um, and it's my job to help these individuals, once they finish certain training with FDM, to actually be placed and deployed in secure roles with clients. So a lot of my day focuses on working with a portfolio of clients, and preparing our consultants and, and individuals for certain interviews. So it may be that I'm preparing someone for an interview for DDPP one day in the public sector, maybe that there's a um, pub client in the retail sector the next day. So it is about adapting to each client and hopefully I'm able to, to give a lot of advice um, for the different ways in which you can be successful in an interview. So I won't bore you with too much more about me. Um, if we can move on to the next slide, please. Okay. Okay. Oh, there we go. Um, so we've got a few examples here of the various stages of an interview process. Now, this can vary massively depending on which business, which company you're applying to. So I would definitely say, um, just to caveat to this, normally you'll have a recruiter, a hiring manager, someone you've been in contact with before you start this process who should be able to talk you through the various stages before you actually get into it. So always a good idea to find out what exactly it is you have to do to get the job. Um, but some of the common um, stages, phase one should normally be just a bit of an introductory call. This is where you will go through the basics of the job, make sure that you can uh, be in the location, for example, make sure that you can meet the basic criteria for the job. Um, generally get your interest in the job as well, make sure that you're, you, you are actually interested and your, your general skills are a good match. This call might just be with, um, as I said, one of the recruiters or someone in HR perhaps, or someone managing the vacancies for the company. So it might not necessarily be with the actual line manager who, who has the, the position. But this one is just about making sure that you kind of understand the job that you're applying for. So having a look on the website um, it's also a good chance to, to quickly ask any questions about some of the conditions or things you might be signing up for as well so it shouldn't be too scary that one but it's just there the best. Um, and phase two quite often there will be a slightly more formal introductory um, telephone or video interview so I know at FDM we do video interviews at this stage. Um, they are pre-recorded, which is a, a whole other ball game, and they are becoming a little bit more common. So if you're not used to or comfortable with doing the, the pre-recorded video interviews, it's definitely worth having a look online and getting a bit more comfortable with that. Um, I do think during the pandemic we've all got much more used to doing these things online. So hopefully that's become a little bit easier, but definitely something to watch out for. Um, if this is on a telephone interview as well, either way, normally about half an hour, um, maybe slightly less. And this tends to focus on a few more strengths, competency based interview questions, which are in line with the company's values. OK, so strength and competency based. Um, strength based is all about looking at your capabilities, your interests, making sure that you've got that, that interest and that eagerness to do the job. Um, potentially looking at hypothetical examples, all based on your potential and your interests. Competency is slightly more based on your specific past experiences. So you may have a question that starts with, tell me about a time when, or can you give me an example of a time when you've shown this, this skill? So those are slightly different ways of answering questions, but quite common in this phase two of the interview stages where they'll drill down a little bit more into your skills and it gets a little bit more serious and structured, I suppose. Um, phase three, if there is one, sometimes this is connected to phase two, you may have just one face-to-face -face interview, but as this is a, a phase three, um, the main interview, often face-to-face -face, um, with the hiring manager or virtually face-to-face -face if we're probably for the next few months or so still. Um, so this is when they'll drill down even further into your, your suitability for the organisation and the role. 
quite likely by this stage there won't be many candidates left um, to interview for per one position. So by this stage, you know you you, you know you're doing well. You've got the the basic skills. You've got the um, the general interest. You've made a good impression on the first two stages. Um, but this is when you want to really really focus on some some great examples. Um, for those of you going for a slightly more senior position, this is when you really want to look at your past experiences and say, what have I achieved? What have I previously delivered? Um, how have I managed to, to do that? What skills do I have that are going to be perfect for this company and, and show the benefit? For those of you going for a more junior position, um, potentially a graduate position or a, just a generally more junior one, it's okay here to give hypothetical examples if you've not got 20 years in the industry. Um, but again, it, it's highlighting the skills that you have that are going to be beneficial to the organisation. Um, any additional requests? So the company might ask you to do a presentation. Um, I know potentially within uh, marketing roles or anything a bit more creative or um, anything like that, you may be asked to give a presentation or, or perhaps show a portfolio of work, perhaps. So make sure that you're aware of, of what you need to do. Um, it may be that you have, um, you know, a final presentation to do. Um, maybe you have to submit some work. So just to make sure um, whether that is at the, the initial stage or whether this is at the end that you are prepared to submit or present or, or do any of the extra bits and bobs that you might need for the role. Has anyone got any questions on those interview stages before we move on? No? Okay, we can always go through questions at the end as well, that's fine. Okay, great. So um, how to make a good first impression? So I think, again, this is probably even more important now that we're all doing things online. Um, it's much more difficult to come across uh, as you would in person. And I, I know for, for some of us that, you know, it's been a big shift. So even more important at the moment to, to make a good impression and um, being conscious how you appear. Um, when we're physically back in offices and things, it is important when you first enter that building, how you interact with you know, the receptionist, how you um, speak with the colleagues. It's not just about the most senior person in the room that you're interviewing with. It's about everyone else and, and how you present yourself. Um, as it says there, online being extra enthusiastic. So I know it seems really odd to say eye contact and body language when we're sitting behind a screen, but just making sure that you are trying to look up into the camera as much as possible, especially if you've got a second monitor. Sometimes it can be quite distracting if we're looking away from the camera onto a second monitor. So do make sure that you're, you're trying to engage with the interviewer um, virtually if you have to. Um, being extra enthusiastic, again, some of the little um, Facial expressions and, and gestures that we make need to be a little bit more exaggerated when we are online. So do make sure that, that you can do that and exaggerate it and speaking a little bit more clearly as well. I know I have a habit of speaking very, very quickly. So do stop me if I uh, if I gloss over anything a bit too fast for you all. Um, OK, so if you don't know what to wear, you can check out the company's website, social media. Um, as it says here, always looking smart, um, better to be overdressed than underdressed. Um, but what a, a great tip as well is, as we said before, regarding the um, initial stages of interview, you'll normally have someone you're in communication with in the lead up to these interviews. So whether that's a recruiter or, or someone from HR or whoever it might be, just ask them. Um, it's you know their job at this stage to, to help you get into to the right position for the interview. So normally you'll be able to find out what's best um, to wear. So yeah, definitely find out what, what to wear is, is best. Um, being at ease with yourself, again, this is a little bit easier said than done in the work because interviews aren't, aren't pleasant sometimes, they are a bit scary, but it's you know your chance to ask questions as well. You want to make sure you feel at ease with the interviewer. This is potentially someone you're going to be working with eight hours a day, um, five days a week. So you do want to make sure that you can build that rapport both ways as well. So try and relax. Um, I know for, for myself, especially when working at home, you know, I, I need to make sure that I'm I'm up and, and ready a good sort of half an hour to 45 minutes before and I've had my coffee and, and, and you know, in a good zone. So try not to rush in the mornings and rush into it. You want to be in a, a good, relaxed place if you can. 
Um, the elevator pitch, so a bit of an Americanized term here, but it's a, uh, a tool that we use at FDM to help people with a, an introductory um, pitch, I suppose. I think pitch sounds a little bit salesy, but it's very good to have no more than 90 seconds as a, a bit of an introduction. It's quite common in interviews that they give you a chance to tell me a bit about yourself or introduce yourself or can you tell me a little bit about your previous experience as an open question. So I would always try and work chronologically with this. Um, for the graduates that I prepare for interviews, I suggest that they start at their degree um, and work up to where they are today. So just give a 90 second, did this degree, um, this was great, this wasn't so great, this is why I've chosen to apply for this company, um, and a little bit about your hobbies and interests as well. I think that's important to get in there. So if you haven't got this already, I do think just spending some time and um, putting together a sort of 60 to 90 second elevator pitch is, um, is a really good idea. Okay, so making eye contact, we mentioned before, um, giving them all equal attention. Now, this really is difficult virtually, and we appreciate that. So I think when, you're, when you are on a virtual interview, just, just focus on trying to speak into and look into the camera. But when you are back in physical offices and, and going in and interviewing with people face to face, um, if there are multiple interviewers, then, then yes, please definitely um, give them equal attention. Um, it's just a question that's popped up in the chat there. Do you have a structure for an elevator pitch we can follow? Um, yes, what I'll do actually is I can put something together and we can share that. Um, I'm sure Sarah can send that out um, via email to people. Um, but yeah, I think in, in general uh, advice for the structure for the elevator pitch, um, as I said, you can work backwards. But what I'll do is I'll put some um, points together, adapt it slightly for people that have um, sort of less experience and more experience and, and we can send that out. Okay. Um, okay, so ensure that you come across enthusiastic and polite in email comms and follow up. So this is really important, um, especially at the end of the initial interview, just thanking them for their time. Um, but also a little bit of a follow up can be really, really great just to remind them of you, just to seal the deal, I suppose, so to speak. Um, just make sure that there's that nice positive note that's left on just a quick note. Um, if you don't have a direct email, then passing it through the recruiter is, is always a good, good idea. Um, and of course, try to stay positive. Again, sometimes easier said than done if you're a bit nervous, but just the importance of smiling and, and trying to keep positive, both in your body language, facial expressions, but also in the content of your answers, trying to move slightly away from negative topics or weaknesses and, and focus on what you're, what you're good at. It's your chance to show off, essentially, so try and stay positive. Okay, <clears throat> so important to do your research. So obviously this is before the interview itself. Um, so basic things, Google, um, look at the websites, speak to, again, this um, all important sort of pre-recruiter HR person that you're speaking with. Um, social media is, is great, I think, especially to get a feel for the company outside of just what they do but a little bit more about some of the social networks, potentially, um, some of the benefits, um, and, and actually get a bit of honesty from people that work there. I think you get that a lot more on social media platforms than you do just on websites. So that's always a good, good idea. Um, and award ceremonies and, and bits and bobs that go on. There's plenty of awards that are, are shared, especially with companies. Um, I know there's a lot of networks and leads, um, particularly around women, for example. Um, as, we, as we all know, there's a lot of um, companies that may share similar values to, to your own. So it's always good to have a little look online and, and make sure that that is in line with, with what you want to do and, and what you want to gain from an organisation and an employer. Um, researching the interviewer, this is actually really, really good, especially um, if it's virtual, to get a bit of an understanding of who they are. Um, and it makes up for potentially not being able to have that face to face interaction at the moment. So having a look on people's LinkedIn, I find, is the, is the best, um, just so you can see perhaps where they've worked before. Um, where they're from perhaps you might have a football team in common you might have worked for a similar company or know someone that's worked there so anything like that can really really help to just solidify the the, the um the rapport building just help to make that connection and, and break the ice a little bit as well if you can mention it in the, in the sort of initial small talk um, before the actual interview itself 
and um, know the role so this is really frustrating um when you interview someone and they don't actually know what they've applied for appreciate a lot of people are applying for lots at the moment um, especially with the pandemic going on and um, you know everyone's aware of that that there's roles left right and center and people are trying to, to apply for lots of things but just try and remember what it is you've applied for and when you are contacted about a role make sure that you can talk about it and do the research before the actual interview and um, there's yeah it is quite frustrating if, if an interviewer has given up their time and, and they the, the candidate doesn't know anything about the role or can't remember which one this was that they applied for and um, so do make sure because that that goes hand in hand with having a good first impression I think as well um, again you can ask the recruiter about this and um, look on things like um, Glassdoor is a good one and um, again LinkedIn articles social media good just to find out if other people have been in the role as well um, but just rereading the jobs back again before you go into the interview and you, I find it quite useful to potentially steal some of the terminology and if you can put that into your interview it's quite a good tick in the box for they've you know they've understood that bit and, and we can see that they've got that skill okay Okay, so a few points here, um, which are just kind of standout techniques and, and bits and bobs that people um, find useful, that I found anyway, that people find useful, um, and some things that you're not expecting perhaps that, that are quite important. Um, so the first one here is the, the STAR methodology. Um, so what this means is it's a way to answer competency style questions particularly. So as we said in the beginning, these are things like tell me about a time when or give me an example of a time you've shown this skill. So STAR stands for situation, task, action, result. So that means that you can describe the situation. You have to describe the task at hand, the action you took and the positive result at the end. I always find it helps to keep me structured because, again, as I said before, I can I can talk quite quickly. I find sometimes if I'm nervous, um, I can get a little bit waffly sometimes. So this helps to keep me structured if I'm thinking of an example. So I could say, um, so when I was at university, this happened and there was this problem. Um, I stepped up and did this. And as a result, we were able to achieve a first. So it's just that structure to help a little bit. Um, body language, moving across the slides, um, we have touched upon this before, but it is really, really important. Um, so again, one of my weaknesses, I'm quite uh, quite handy. <laughs> so trying to maybe put my hands um, on the desk in front of me or, or find ways to, to keep it a little bit less distracting. Um, on the other side of that, so I know some people that don't use their hands at all, which can also be equally um, perhaps distracting and, and, and help to potentially um, not show the enthusiasm as much. So just trying to find that balance between using your body language um, and then obviously eye contact and things come in there as well. I'm just going to go to the chat because I think there's a couple of questions. I um, feel like they don't always want to hear how well you've worked with someone, rather hear how you didn't work well and what you did about it. Um, yeah, so that's a good point. I think there's always questions um, regarding teamwork. I think that's quite a common question. I think the point of the STAR methodology and, and any questions like that is to focus on what you did rather than what everyone else did. Um, definitely you can talk, I think that's quite a common answer, talking about a problem when other people in the team weren't pulling their weight or there was an issue with teamwork. But what you need to focus on is what you did to rectify that. So perhaps there was someone in the group that wasn't submitting work or turning up to um, sessions. But if you've taken an action to go and speak to that person outside of the group, find out if there's a problem, work with them to rectify it. It shows your skills for not only teamwork, but leadership, communication, all of that. So, yes, um, I think it's it's good to you know focus on um, some of the challenges you've overcome. But the point is to focus on what you've done. Um, so hopefully either that answers your question. Okay, um, moving on to expect the unexpected. Um, so we call them curveball questions at FDM. So these are the, the sort of notorious things like what fruit would you be and why, or who would play you in a movie of your life. Um, so these are all about, it's not about the actual answer. Okay, the question obviously isn't testing any of your skills or anything like that, nine times out of 10. It's about your reaction to it. 
So it's about seeing what you do when you're presented with a question that you couldn't possibly have prepared for. OK, so I always just think um, if you are completely blindsided by these, just taking a moment, perhaps saying, oh, interesting question. Haven't thought of that. Can I have a couple of seconds to think about it? It's absolutely fine to have a pause, think about your answer, then deliver an answer rather than just scrambling about it and panicking. OK, so I always think um, maybe have a, a look online because there are quite a few common um, curveball questions online some of them are you know for the, the big companies like google i know there's quite there's some quite famous ones on there um but these are some and again after the session we've got a, a kind of portfolio of these that we've collected over the years from various clients so happy to share them out and perhaps it's something we can discuss in, in one of the breakout rooms shortly as well okay um questions so it's not all about you being assessed okay it's still your chance to to assess whether the company is going to be right for you so do you think of some some questions that you might like to ask the interviewer there's a lot that can't be explained potentially on a on job spec online or can't always be found out purely from reading information so things about the actual interviewer are always good i think um you know what, how do you find your role um what, what's your um, experience within the company have you changed roles before maybe a little bit more about the context of the program or the project that you'll be going into um anything to do with the, the specifics i suppose about the company and what it's like to work there i think you're really really good um another one i really like is asking whether there can be something you can be working on in between now and starting the role it kind of gives them a little, it's, it's a little bit of confidence that you think you've got the job, but not in a cocky way. If you can say, um, you know, great, what can I be doing in the meantime before I start? Can I be learning on a particular technical tool or do I need to go and have a look at a particular um, article, research something? It just helps to A, engage further, show your enthusiasm. And as I said, just gives that little bit of confidence that you feel that you're you know, good for the role and you, you think you've got a good chance of being successful. Um, we have mentioned the elevator pitch before. So as I said, we will, uh, we'll put some notes together and send that out. Um, and I just think this is just a great way of, of starting really confidently. I think if you've absolutely um, you smashed your elevator pitch, you have a sense of confidence. and The interview also does as well. More importantly, it also gives you a chance to um, to, to run through what you want to, to talk about. So if you can bring up a specific piece of it, a bit of experience in your in your repertoire, um, it can help to lead the interview down that route rather than them picking up something in your CV you perhaps don't really want to talk about as much. So it's a good way for you to lead the interview a bit. Um, and finally on this slide is hobbies and interests. So I think it's quite a common misconception that talking about your personal life or your hobbies and interests is, is unprofessional. Um, it's not, it really helps to um, build that rapport, obviously within reason, depending on what your hobbies are, but um, it is good to have a little bit of a um, personal note at the end, because it may well be that you share the same hobby with the interviewer, or they have a, if it's a, if it's something to do with sports, for example, they might do a sports uh, a football team um, at, at that company that you can get involved with. They might do a charity bake sales and you really like baking. So whatever it is, it may well help to, again, further that rapport building um, and just break the ice a bit. And it just helps to, to give you a little bit of a nice conversation before you go straight into the, the structure of questions. OK, can we move to the next slide, please? Thank you. OK, um, so with these, we've had a look at some of the, I suppose, the, the, the most hated questions or the, the difficult ones that, that, that do come up. Um, sometimes the employer tries to look at your weaknesses. So things like what is your great greatest weakness? They ask you what is um, you know an example of, of something that's gone wrong in your life or something negative. Basically, they always sometimes have these in anything negative. So what they're looking for here is that a you can admit um, you know your weaknesses. They're looking for humility. Everyone has weaknesses. Uh, if you go in and, and can't think of anything, it's you know, it's, it's not a true reflection of us as, as human beings. So try and think of something that you can say if this does come up. That's not, um, you know, I, I, I never get to work on time. You want to make sure it is fairly professional, but something that you can um, you can describe and you can also describe what you're doing to overcome this. OK, so things like public speaking or 
um, written language or I don't know what it might be, Excel or maths, uh, you know, numerical skills, something like this. And um, for me, my numbers are awful. I'm terrible with, with numbers and things like that. So I always think about something like that, but then more importantly, focus on what I'm doing to overcome this. So potentially that could be looking at a LinkedIn tutorial, working with peers, colleagues, friends to, to overcome this putting yourself out of your comfort zone. So if it's public speaking, perhaps you've, you've actually gone out your way to do something where you've had to speak in public. Um, so as it says there, turning a negative into a positive is key. Um, now I do think this is important to prepare beforehand because it's not as easy just to think of off the cuff. Um, and as we've said in the, in the, the chat there, I always found this to be the hardest one to fight the right answer. It, it is a difficult one. So I do think it's very difficult to do off the cuff, but if you've prepared for it, it can be really good. OK, so definitely have a think um, if you haven't done so already. It's better to be prepared in this question, not come up than the other way around. So do have a think about some things that you can you can talk about here and more importantly, the steps you're taking. OK. OK, tell me about something you've accomplished. So, again, these are all things that you can prepare for in advance. Um, Hopefully you'll get a bit of a picture from the, the interview or at least from the first, that, that first stage interview. They'll normally give you an idea of the kind of questions or kind of interview. Um, you know, this is going to be competency based. This is going to be strength based. This is going to be all around your experience. So hopefully you'll get an idea, but it is good to prepare for these questions just in case. So have a think about the, you know, the stories that you can, um, you can try and include, okay? Um, do try and make sure the accomplishment is relatable to the new role, but I'm aware it's not always going to be 100% relatable. It may be that you, you, know, you want to talk about something outside of work. Um, just make sure it's relatively professional. You can do something, you know, if it's a charity event, if it's a, you know, a marathon and things, that's absolutely fine if it's not to do with work. Um, but just make sure it's, it's not, um, you know, it's still within the realms of professionalism, essentially. Um, and as it says there, really focusing on the impact and the outcomes that this has had on, on you, um, whether that's you as a person, you know, whether you've become stronger from doing, I'm going to use the marathon example again, you know, physically stronger, it's a lot of mental um, focus that you've got to do, a lot of time, um, practice, focus, planning that goes into things like this. So it's not just the outcome that you finished a race. You know, the outcome is you've become a more organised person, a more focused person. Um, you know, it's, it can help you in all sorts of ways and then how that can translate into your work life. OK, so if you can't think of something that's directly related to work, think about how the outcomes and the benefits of doing this can therefore relate. I hope that makes sense. OK, next one, please. Thank you. Uh, OK, the dreaded where do you see yourself in five years time? This is a bit of a cliche one, but it is still used. Um, a lot of a lot of our clients at FDM still use this. So definitely something to think of. Um, I think this can differ. I think if you're going for a, um, a graduate role or a more junior role, perhaps this is focusing on the experience that you're going to get in the first five years or early five years of your career. Um, if it's a more senior role, then it may be able to be a little bit more specific if you see yourself into a, you know, a management position, for example. But just think about um, focusing on what you want to accomplish rather than a job title. OK, so it doesn't need to be that specific, but we want a little bit more specific than I want to gain some good experience. OK, so it needs to be I really like to gain experience in this I'd like to improve my Excel skills um, within five years I'd like to be in a position where I'm managing a small team or have management responsibilities okay so a few points in there but not too specific I want to be the director of this okay so it's just a little bit um, more focused and, and obviously this shows commitment to the company and to your, your career development as well and um, sometimes for particularly for junior roles they like to do where do you see yourself in two, five or ten. OK, so make sure you've got the early idea, what you want to initially focus into, um, sort of settling into the role, understanding the skills, building a network, then what you want to achieve in five years time. 
um, way into the future where you can see yourself being. Um, obviously, we don't expect you to know what, what's going to happen in 10 years, but it's just good to show that commitment and that eagerness. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you, Amy. That's really useful. As someone who's just started interviewing, as well as, you know, being the interviewee, it's been really useful for me to understand some of the things that I should be watching out for for my candidates and what constitutes a good answer. So thank you so much. No worries. Um, so I guess now is the time where we're going to be going into some breakout rooms. Let's say we'll have just 10 minutes. So we've got five minutes when we come back and then you'll have a few minutes as well before nine o'clock. So I know everybody likes to kind of get in that work mode, make a coffee, whatever it might be um, before you have your nine o'clock meetings. Um, so we've got three questions here. Um, describe your leadership style. Tell me about a time when you made a mistake and do you have any questions for me? So that last one is around, you know, the types of questions that you would ask the interviewer um, at the end of the interview when they kind of throw it open, uh, throw it over to you. Um, so we're gonna have those 10 minutes there. Um, and yeah, we'll be sending you into your breakout rooms. And then if you could make some notes, maybe we'll have time to discuss answers. Um, we'll see how we're doing for time. <laughs> 